Okay, so yeah, I'll be talking about uh, exploiting the Lexmark printer. Um, some work we did when we were doing uh, the pwn to own competition in the last two years. So just a quick introduction. Um, basically, I'm going to go over how the Lexmark printer sort of just implements the PostScript stack in a specific network daemon. Um, enough about the PostScript language so that you understand the bugs and then two different um, bugs that we exploited during the competition. Uh, so yeah, I work at NCC Group as part of a group of four people, but the others weren't able to come. Oops. Um, so just a really quick intro. With Lexmark Printer, you can basically just think of it as a, a Linux box running 32-bit ARM. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, all the research we did was on a specific model, which was the 3224, um, and we targeted it twice during own to own competitions. They did recently switch it, so if you decide to try it after this, you might want to buy the different model. But um, most of the bugs we found and the other contestants and stuff found uh, affected 200 plus printer models, so it probably doesn't really matter which one you choose to buy if you try it. Um, just as far as getting started, if you wanted to replicate some of it, we just use the typical tools like IDA for decompilation, red sync, pound bag, stuff like this. Ideally, you want to root some printer so that you can actually debug it. Um, generally, prior to the last competition, we had uh, released a blog which some people were replicating to root the printers. Um, but more recently, there's a guy named Blasty that open sourced his exploit from Pwn to Own, which is useful if you want to try it. Um, and in general, it's worth noting that the firmwares are encrypted, which was sort of um, documented by a group called Clarity, and I, I think re more recently by somebody else. But Blasty also open sourced a decryptor, so you can try to use it if you need to. Um, yeah, so prior to the first Pwn to Own competition that they introduced the printer, there wasn't a lot of public research about it, but then you can see in 2021 there was um, six issues exploited, and then more recently there was 10, and it's the next competition is coming up, so presumably there's going to be more, and five of those uh, were in PostScript stack, so it seems kind of interesting uh, if you want to take a look at it after. Um, as far as PostScript in general, there's been a lot of research. Um, and this, none of it is related to Lexmark, but in the future, if you want to reference some of it, you can. This is just the last maybe four or five years, and some of the papers reference even older uh, research. So it goes back quite far. Um, yeah, so a quick look at how PostScript uh, works on Lexmark. Uh, if you're familiar with like other PostScript stacks, it's likely Adobe has their own, and there's one called GoScript by Artifacts, which is what's usually on Linux. Um, but Lexmark seemed to roll their own completely, um, and they implemented in something called the PageMaker binary. Um, really, it's just a network daemon that listens on 9100, and it speaks this language called PJL, which I won't go into. But basically, you can just use PJL to tell it to start speaking the PostScript language, just using this command at the bottom. And um, yeah. That's all you need to do. Uh, just a quick side note. Interestingly, they implemented their own heap algorithm, which is open source, and they did have their own paper about it in 2013. Um, we didn't have to actually go into any deep, like in-depth de uh, analysis of the heap, but I think it would be an interesting topic for people to look at in the future, especially if you like looking at custom heaps. Um, yeah, so as far as mitigations go for the, this PageMaker binary, I, it's, it's not great, but I guess considering it's a printer, it's okay. But the, the main important point is that it's not position independent. So um, even though there's a, some kind of sketchy ASLR, it doesn't really matter. But there is NX, um, and there was partial um, read-only relocations to begin with. But right before the 2022 competition, they added full rel row, which I'll talk about a little bit. Um, and I guess a little bit surprising, at least to me, is it is actually sandboxed. Um, they use systemd to do it. So there's a service file that you can look at for the complete details. There's actually quite a lot in it. but um, And it might have changed recently, but I only looked at the version uh, prior to the last competition. So basically it runs with reduced U, uh, UID and GID. And there's a lot of uh, restricted access to slash var, which Lexmark uses a lot. Um, there is restricted system calls, but it didn't affect us at all. Um, and so basically if you, you pop a shell on it, you ideally want to get root. So you just need to 
find a local privilege escalation. And there was one um, published by Blasty recently as well, which is worth looking at. Um, and then, yeah, so onto the actual language itself. Um, basically, PostScript is just a language for kind of describing the layout of um, pages that are going to be printed by the printer. It's pretty complicated. Um, it's about 900 pages in the spec, which is kind of interesting to read, but also kind of boring. Um, they have, they've gone through three major sort of language revisions that seem to make it more and more complicated, but um, surprisingly it's Turing complete, so it's um, got a lot of useful functionality, and it's stack-based. Um, so there's an operand stack which holds like arguments and stuff for the functions, the execution stack which tracks the actual functions being executed, and then a dictionary stack which uh, won't really matter for us. Probably the weirdest thing about it is that it's reverse Polish notation, which makes uh, reading PostScript code quite confusing at the beginning, but basically it pushes the arguments, um, like the first argument first, second, third, and then it will have the actual function name. Um, but yeah, also the return value of when a function is called is placed at the top of the stack. And whatever function is called will typically clean up the arguments unless it um, runs into an error and then whoever called it is will typically uh, clean up the arguments. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of data types um, that are dealt with and usually I'm just going to refer to these as operands because usually we're working on the operand stack but there's a lot of typical sort of data types that um, you would run into like integers and strings and stuff and I'll go over them, uh, at, at the ones that we need to understand as far as exploiting bugs go. Uh, and since it's turning complete, I guess there's, you know, control flow stuff, conditional uh, branches and stuff and when I was looking at it, I even found someone that wrote an HTTP server which is kind of funny to read if you want to see something weird. Um, so I'll go over the like uh, lower level details of the operands because it'll be relevant to exploitation. So basically um, the operand stack will just always have 8 byte structures um, and basically it looks like the C code. You've got a 1 byte type, uh, a 1 byte permission which isn't going to be relevant to us so you can just kind of always assume it's read write. You've got a 2 byte length value and then a 4 byte union. So in some cases it's just the raw value and otherwise it's a pointer. I'll just always kind of refer it to it as the value, but if it's pointed to something I'll mention it. Um, and yeah, there's quite a few different types. Some of them I don't know what they are, but um, this, some typical ones you would run into are on the bottom. So. Um, integer is the most uh, simple, so the length is always zero. The value is just uh, like the raw value, so it's not a pointer. Um, and so the PostScript code I show there is just basically pushing the uh, 414, 4141 onto the operand stack. And the weird syntax is just the way they do like 0x for hexadecimal numbers. Um, and so basically if this, this is a debugger view that I used in GDB, which I'll use a lot to try to demonstrate how stuff looks on the stack. But basically you can see the type is integer, um, and then the raw value is what we would expect from pushing it. So string is also super straightforward. The length is just the length of the string, which doesn't include the null byte. And the PostScript has two ways that you can kind of use it. There's the round braces and the angle brackets. Um, and so basically round is just, a, you would pass a string in the postscript, so it would just look like this, these A's. And then if we look at the debug view of the stack, you can see that there's a pointer that's pointing to some A's. And the angle brackets let you use raw hex, so um, which is handy for writing exploits and stuff. But as you can see, you can make A, B, C, D string just by using the raw hex that way, which is nice. Um, so the next one is a name, which is very, very similar to the string, but it's basically a special type that's used for keys in dictionaries. I'll explain dictionaries in a sec. But basically the only difference is that it uses this intermediate structure. So the length in both uh, structures is just whatever the length of the string is. But in the, in the first case, the operand has a pointer that points to the intermediate structure and then that in turn points to the string. But um, yeah, you, you run into these a lot. Um, and so, yeah, we can just confirm in the debugger if you see that there's a pointer. Uh, it actually points to the intermediate structure, which has the length 4, and then the, an additional pointer. And then if we check the final pointer, it points to the hex that the, the name points to. 
Um, so the next important one is the array. In this case, the length uh, determines the number of elements in the array. And basically, the array will just have a value which is a pointer to a block of memory which holds a certain number of operands. And so in this case, we use the square brackets to push um, or just hold three uh, raw hex values. And we can see that it would it's laid out as we would expect given what I just said about how strings are laid out. Um, and same, this would be the uh, debugger view of it. Um, so these are also pretty common. And then uh, dictionaries is basically the same as other programming languages like Python. You've just got key value pairs. Um, they have this double uh, angle bracket syntax. And basically the first value is um, a key, which will end up being a name. I think I forgot to mention, but names, when you see them in the PostScript code, are always prefixed with a slash, which designates them as a name. But actually, that isn't held in the uh, memory that's pointed to by the name operand. But just when you see the slash, you know it's you, a key to a dictionary, usually. Um, so yeah, in this case, the dictionary pointer points to this kind of opaque structure, which I'll explain in more detail later. But for now, all that matters is you know you've got this key value pair. And so in this case, it's kind of as we would expect. There's the name that points uh, to x eventually, and then the raw integer value that we specify in the postscript. Um, and again, this is just what it looks like in the debug view. Uh, so there's only one value, and then name and integer. And that's pretty much it as far as like the, the super common um, data types. If you know those, you'll kind of be able to understand a lot of code and you'll be able to um, exploit most of the bugs that have been found. Um, but yeah, so in general, it uses a bunch of global pointers. Uh, these are my names for them. They use other names, which are a little bit more confusing. But basically, there's always like a, a current stack pointer, which I'll just call psob stack pointer, which points to the current top of the stack, uh, which is sort of the topmost uh, operand. And then there's one which is called top, which is the very um, top possible index of the stack, and then the bottom. Um, and those are basically just used for um, uh, functions to track where the arguments currently are, where to place things like the result, and also doing like bounds checking and stuff to make sure that you're actually staying within the correct bounds. Um, and yeah, the default size is around 1,200 entries, and it will grow dynamically if you push lots of values onto it or whatever. Uh, and then basically the operators are just what they call the PostScript functions. Most of them are implemented in C, so you can just reverse them, but some of them are implemented in PostScript itself because it's a strong enough language that they can do it that way, I guess. Um, and yeah, they're basically just defined in a global uh, table in read-only data, and the table just looks like this, um, where you've got like the name, the function pointer, some, I don't know, value, and then the index into the table. but. Finding this table is really useful if you want to find all the operators to uh, generate um, stuff for a fuzzer or whatever, um, or just looking for bugs. So I'll just go over the operators again enough to si sort of understand what's going on and um, understand the bugs. But the, the easiest is the add operator. So in this case, I'm pushing hex bad, which is argument one, hex coffee, which is argument two, and then add. And then we can see that the bottom of the stack is just the, the bottom entry, which will be argument one, and then the top uh, current stack pointer points to argument two. And then this is what it would look like in the debugger. Uh, so I just have the little colon, colon, bottom to designate where the bottom is. Um, and so this is just a really simple uh, decompilation of what add looks like. Um, so basically it just does some basic bounds checking to make sure that there's an, you know, enough space on the stack for the two arguments that it expects. It assigns pointers to both of them, and then it sets a result um, pointer that will point to where argument one currently points to because it's basically just going to clobber it with the return value. It makes sure the arguments aren't zero. If not, it adds them together and puts it on the stack, and then it adjusts the current stack pointer by one because there was two arguments, but it's pushing the result back on the stack. So it's just reusing argument one's um, location. Um, and so then you would you would end up like this uh, with the result. So you get a value, which is the addition of both, and both the bottom stack pointer, because we had only pushed one thing, and the top uh, current uh, top pointer points there. 
And again, debug view of that uh, is pretty straightforward. So a more interesting uh, operator is get interval, which basically lets you read from uh, things like arrays and strings at specific indexes, and you can specify the length that you want to read. So in this case, I'm pushing this 12-byte string uh, onto the stack, and I'm saying at offset 4, give me 4 bytes um, from it. So uh, we're basically going to be targeting the BBBs of the uh, first argument to get interval. And then the result is that uh, all of the previous arguments are popped up the stack, and we're just left with uh, you know a string, which is basically what we told it to get, um, which is pretty straightforward, I think. Um, but yeah, it's worth noting that the original string that we were using went away. So that kind of leads into this other operator, which is duplication. So you, you basically, it just creates a copy of whatever the current top of the stack is and, and pushes a, uh, another one. So it basically just looks like this. The m main thing of note is that it, uh, the pointer just still points to the same memory. It's only duplicating the operand itself. But that way you don't lose certain strings and stuff you're working on from the operand stack when you use functions like get interval and stuff. So then similar to get interval, there's put interval for writing. Um, the only difference is that it doesn't push anything onto the stack because it's just modifying sort of what you're telling it to modify. So in this case, I just uh, still push the 12-byte string on the stack, but I'm using a dupe so that the string sticks around after the arguments are cleaned up so that we can look at it afterwards. And I'm just saying at index 4, basically modify um, those bytes with the string ddd. So we would expect the b's to be replaced. Um, and so at the bottom of the stack is just the, the duplicated uh, one. So after we actually execute that, we end up uh, having that bottom entry still there. And we can see that the memory that it pointed to is now modified with the, the d's. Um, and so the last one of interest for us is basically the index operator. And you can think of it basically as dupe, but you can specify the index on the stack that you want to duplicate. So in this case, I'm just pushing three uh, raw literal values, and I'm basically just saying, give me a duplicate of uh, the entry at index one, which in this case will be BBBB. Um, and then after you execute it, basically we get a, a duplicate of that entry on the top of the stack. Um, yep. So that leads to the first bug, which is a bug in index. Uh, so this is pretty much the whole implementation of the index operator. Um, basically, it just does some basic sanity checks to make sure that the type is actually an integer, that there's enough space for the arguments. It grabs the uh, value you specify as the offset, and it does some bounds check. But the bounds check uh, is prone to an integer overflow. Um, so you can bypass it, and then it will just index from an out of band or out of bounds area on the stack. So you can basically get an out of bounds read and pop some some other value from memory onto the operand stack um, uh, as if it were an operand. So this is super straightforward. Um, and that just being able to control an operand uh, on the stack is enough to get read write, which I'm sure you can imagine looking at the fact that we have get interval and put interval. Uh, we can basically create a, an operand with like an arbitrary pointer um, to start working on. So this is just a quick example of how you would calculate where you want to go out of bounds. Um, so I said that there was 1,282 entries by default on the stack. So if we just wanted to go out of bounds, we would just use whatever index we want, 1283, and then use this calculation. So um, assuming that this is kind of the layout in memory, the operand stack at the bottom, we have some unknown allocations in the heap, and then we're going to try to spray, control some memory or whatever, and, and pull one of those fake operands into the stack. It would look something like that. So in this case, we can just basically have a, a big raw literal string of hex A's and B's. We calculate some index value and see if we can get one of those onto the operand stack. So this is what it would look like right before the um, execution. Um, and then this is sort of the ideal layout. The blue is the actual operand stack with the arguments, and then we've sprayed some values which will be invalid operands, but just as a sort of proof of concept, that's, that's the layout that we would want. 
And we can see that it, in fact, does work when I dump the stack. We've now got some garbage type with the values that we control. Um, so yeah, in general, exploiting that is super easy. Um, when there's no uh, rel, like when there's partial rel row, you can just do something like target the global offset table. So you can read values and write values. So you can over, uh, you can read um, the mem copy address, for instance, and overwrite it later. Um, so basically, the approach that we did to exploit it with partial rel row was just do what I just said: spray the fake operands of string type with a pointer that we control. Um, grab one of those values onto the stack, use get interval and put interval to interact with it. And basically, if we leak mem copy from the global offset table, we can then compute another interesting address in libc, which we can use system. And we can actually just overwrite the mem copy got address with the address of system and then trigger a mem copy call where the destination um, address is a string that we can control. And actually, we can just use put interval for that because um, it's depending on the the sizes of the arguments that you're using with put interval, it'll just inevitably take what you want to write and write it into the original string. But the original string could hold some value like um, the netcat command. And fortunately, netcat comes pre-installed, so you can just really easily run a bind shell if you want to. Um, so... I mentioned that eventually they added full railroad, so it's not as easy as just overriding the uh, a god entry like memcopy. Uh, usually, like the way people approach this is targeting this uh, function pointer called the free hook in libc, and they just overwrite it with system and then free a chunk and um, they can uh, get code exec that way. And I think at least one person did it at own to own. There's some screenshots from the competition that seem to imply, but he hasn't published yet, which I hope he does. But uh, I decided to just see if there was a way to use the Postgres or Postscript stack itself to do it, um, just because I thought it would be kind of interesting. So I spent a bunch of time digging for global function pointers, and I found an operator that uses one, which is called query filter params. Um, and basically, the, my thinking was, okay, I can just overwrite that with system as long as I, uh, you know, can hit the logic. So it's it's pretty simple, but basically, as long as the operand that's passed as the argument is of type filter and there's some global value, gfunc is not um, null. It will just execute that. Um, it's, imp I guess, important to note, I can't overwrite... Um, uh, oh, yeah, I have, that's later. Yeah, that's fine. So if we can overwrite gfunc, actually, with system, we can pass the value to it and just control like a string or whatever. The, the only interesting thing of note is that it has to be of type filter. Um, but so when I just tried to call query filter params uh, from PostScript code, I couldn't actually get it to call. So I wanted to figure out why. And just while looking into that, I realized that in general, when the Lexmark PostScript stack is dispatching like an operator, um, it, it uses a hook table. So basically it looks to see um, where the original function is and then also uh, checks to see if there's some entry in a, in a hook table, um, which is in BSS. And then if it does exist, it will uh, use the hook table to call the other function. In this case, it's worth noting that we can't override the hook table's function pointer to just call system because the arguments passed to it aren't from um, the operand stack. So I thought, what if I just modify the uh, function pointer of some operator I know that I can call and get it to call query filter params instead and then have query filter params use the overrided global function. So I just randomly picked one anchor search because it doesn't get called by anything else. So there's not going to be any weird side effects. So basically, it would just look like this. If this is a hook table, normally uh, you can just overwrite it to point to some fake structure that you write into memory. And then at offset 8, there's a function pointer. And I basically just point it to the query filter params um, operator itself. And then I can sort of bounce through and, and call that. So um, yeah, the new plan in this case is kind of similar. We, we still leak mem copy, say, or some other function from the global offset table, at least to figure out where system is. Then we can write some hook structure into some memory cavity in PageMaker, which is easy because it's not position independent, so we can just write it into the end of BSS or whatever. 
Uh, and the only important thing is that the hook structure at uh, offset 8 points to wh wherever you want to bounce through. So in this case, it's query filter params function. Then we can overwrite the global function pointer to point to the system call again. Um, and then in this case, we have to write the value that we want to execute into somewhere in memory, like again, .bss. And this is because we have to craft like a, a, a filter operand in order to get query, um, query filter params to actually use the operand. So we basically fake one and use index to put it onto the stack and have it point to the string. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, we can, after we do all that, we can basically just call the anchor search operator. Uh, and that will jump through query filter params, which will then call, uh, call the gfunc function pointer. And that's enough to get code exec despite um, full rel row. I think in theory, using the free hook te or technique is easier, but this is still interesting. And I'm sure this will be useful if uh, that, uh, the other technique ever goes away. Um, so the, the other bug is quite a bit more complicated. It's a type confusion bug in an operator called compose font. So I'll try to explain that. Um, so this is a newer operator, uh, which was introduced in the most recent revision of the language. Um, and it's not too important what it does because it does a lot. But basically the idea is that it's going to try to create a composite font of a bunch of other fonts you say and something, uh, a resource in something called the character map. Um, and basically it takes three arguments. The first argument is whatever the name of the font that you're creating is, which we don't care about too much. Um, the second argument is the name of some resource that it's going to try to look up in this character map um, in order to build your composite font. And then argument three is an array of fonts that you're saying you want to sort of compose together into this new font that it's going to build. And it expects those to either be dictionaries, which are basically just fonts of, you know, a specific layout or a name of a font, which it will look up and find the associated dictionary for it. And basically the result it gives you is a font. But in this case, again, it's just a dictionary with some sort of set of keys that follows the, the spec. So it, the keys are things like the character map, um, and most importantly, there's one called the font dependency vector, which is kind of like a representation of the original arrays you said that you wanted to com composite together. Um, so yeah, when it just this is what the uh, operand stack looks like when we would call it. In in our case, we, we don't actually care too much. The the name of the font output font we don't care about. Um, the second argument with the ends is basically the, the character map resource we're going to look up. In this case, the ends are invalid, which will be important later. And in this case, I'm just passing in a, some array of length two, but actually it's not going to matter because of the type confusion. But um, this one's up. So yeah, the, the beginning of the compose font I don't bother showing the code just because there's a lot to it, but it basically does a bunch of sanity checks on the arguments that are passed and stuff. Um, but basically, as long as argument two is a name, it's going to call this find resource operator, which is going to look up the character map sort of, uh, or look in the character map resource to find whatever this name is. Uh, and so the find resource operator itself takes two arguments. One is a copy of the name that we passed a compose font, and then the other one is just saying it's going to uh, look it up in the character map. Um, and if you read the spec for this find resource function, the most important thing is if it says if the category exists, which is going to be the character map, so it's going to exist, but there is no instance whose name is key, and the, the name is what we control and it was a bunch of ends, an undefined resource error occurs. So we can take a look at how, what this looks like when compose font is calling find resource. Basically, this chunk of code is where it's just creating a duplicate of the um, the resource we want to look up in the character map. Uh, it makes sure that it's a name. Uh, it makes room on the stack for the two arguments that are, it's using, like it's passing to find resource. 
Um, it, it basically pushes the slash cmap argument to the function which is argument two, and then it calls find resource. And as per the spec, it says if an error occurs, it like this undefined resource error because the um, resource doesn't exist, it will, uh, the caller will clean up the stack for it and then it will return because there was an error. So we can see what this looks like when we're calling it. Basically, this is the stack right before we call find resource. So the bottom three are the original um, arguments that were passed to compose font and the top two are what's being passed to find resource. So we're passing this name, which is garbage. So we would expect it to trigger this undefined resource error. And this is the result that we get back after find resource returns. So the two arguments that were passed to it still exist on the stack, which means an error occurred, but it doesn't set G error occurred. So um, this is a problem. Um, and I'll show you why. But basically the, the problem is um, we just saw that the compose font will, if, if an error actually occurred, compose font will clean up the two arguments past defined resource. But if no error occurred, compose font is going to assume that the only value on the stack is a result. So it's going to use the result pop it, which is one, and then keep going. So basically what you end up with is one extra value on the operand stack. So th this is the code right after it does the error checking, and we can see it basically sets a pointer, um, which is for the result, which is where it assumes the result is going to be, which is where arg1 actually is. Um, and then it uses this result by putting it into what is effectively the output dictionary uh, that's returned as a font eventually. And then it only adjusts the stack pointer by one. But actually there's two arguments that were passed to find resource that are still on the stack. So actually now after uh, we finish that bit of code, what we're left with is the name, the garbage name um, that we had left there, which compose font now actually thinks is an array. It thinks that this is the third argument that was passed to it, um, which is interesting because we can abuse that. So um, if we were recall originally, the, the argument three array that we passed to compose font is meant to be names um, or dictionaries. Uh, and the name is of uh, the name of a font that is going to try to look up. Otherwise, if it's a dictionary, it just assumes it's a font and it uses it. And basically, this array is used to populate the font dependency vector in the output font object. Um, and so, yeah, going back to the beginning when I went over the types, the array, the length is the number of elements, whereas the name is the length of the string. But in this point, it's going to be confused and think the length of the name is actually the length of the array. Um, so I'll show that in a bit more detail in a sec. But basically, um, this is what it looks like when it's parsing the actual array past the compose font in order to try to collect these fonts to put into the um, font dependency vector output array. So basically it allocates whatever, um, it basically allocates a new output array uh, block of operands based on the size that it thinks it's getting. So in this case we had passed eight ends. So it's gonna allocate space for eight operands. And then basically it goes through this for loop and tries to check every entry in the array. Um, and basically if the entry is a dictionary, it'll just basically take that entry and copy it from the, the one that we had provided uh, and put it directly into the uh, output array. But if not, it calls this other operator called find font. So it's assuming that you passed a name to a font that you want to compose. And then it will, if it finds this font, it will pa or return a dictionary and it will copy that dictionary into the output array. And then I just adjust the stack again because it uh, uh, passed one argument to find font to do the lookup. Um, the interesting thing about this call is that even if you don't pass a name, it doesn't, it doesn't work for all operands. I forget which ones it works f for, but certain ones like integers, um, when you pass them to find font, even though it's not a name, it'll actually still succeed and it will return you a reference to the courier font, which I guess is like the default or something. 
But basically just those two if conditions are what we're interested in and kind of what we want. We basically want it to parse this confused array and either find dictionaries or things that make fine font return a dictionary. So uh, this is kind of what it would look like uh, in a diagram. You've got the name, which is now confused as an array. So in the middle, this is the intermediate structure, which points to the end string. But because it's confused and it thinks it's array, it thinks the first intermediate structure there is actually index zero of the array, and it's just going to keep walking down whatever's adjacent in memory, looking for these dictionaries. So we can check this in the debugger. Um, this is what the confused sort of operand stack looks like. And so we can basically just use the debugger to change the type of the name to an array. Um, and then uh, we can see where it points to, which is the uh, spot we want to dump. And then if we dump the contents of the array, we can see the first uh, entry at index zero there is type eight. And eight is actually the length of the name intermediate structure. So uh, the following two entries are integers, which are just uncontrolled values that find font will still like. And then the, the last entries from three until seven in this example are just uh, fake dictionaries that I actually put there on purpose using feng shui um, that all will point somewhere in memory. Um, so I, the next question is, okay, so how do we build these sort of fake dictionary operands? Well, we, can, we already kind of saw it with uh, index. We can just use like spray or feng shui to basically uh, use hex literals and strings and populate what's adjacent to that intermediate structure in memory. Um, and it works quite well. So basically this is what it looks like in the diagram. So again, there's those two integer values that tend to be after the intermediate structure, which we don't control. But then afterwards, we just have a whole bunch of these um, dictionary operands that all point to somewhere, which is going to be a fake dictionary structure. Um, and we can put that structure at some sprayed memory address that we can guess. So we just get everything pointing there. And I'll go into more detail about the fake dictionary structure <laughs> in a little bit. Um, yeah, so before I go into what the fake dictionary structure actually looks like, the main thing of interest is that um, we can basically get that loop I showed earlier to copy fake dictionary operands into this font dependency vector, which is part of the output font that we're eventually going to get back in PostScript. And so I'm just going to show how it kind of looks like to actually get access to that. So at the, the top for loop is the confused sort of loop that I showed earlier, where it was populating this output arrays entries um, buffer. And so here, basically, as long as everything went OK and it copied the expected number of array uh, or expected number of elements in the array, it creates an array type and basically just adds those to the font dependency vector key of the output object, which is the font that eventually we're going to get back. Um, so yeah, basically, the font dependency vector, when it's all done, is going to look like this. So basically, find... Uh, font or whatever it was, will populate these three garbage sort of courier values uh, in, the, in the array. And then the, the last ones are these special dictionaries that we placed in memory. Um, so just to show what it looks like in the debugger, in this case, this would be after compose font actually returns and was already confused. And we kind of abused this bug to get the, the array value. So we dump the dictionary. Uh, which is the top of the stack, which is the font object that was returned to us. And then we dump all of those um, key value pairs, and we see the, the last one here is the font dependency vector. So if we dump that, we can see that it indeed does hold um, all of the dictionaries that we expect. And the last five are the ones uh, which are basically the fake dictionary operands that we can control. So the, the pointer points to the sprayed memory. Um, so I, I would say the biggest caveat of this whole thing is that we don't have a leak primitive already, so we don't really know where to point 
Um, we, we can craft those fake dictionary operands, but we don't know where to point them in memory for sure. But because it's a 32-bit address space, it does make it easier. And ASLR is not great, so actually it's, it's fairly straightforward to uh, find a, a predictable heap spray address that actually works even across versions. Um, and yeah, if it was 64-bit, it would be harder, but... Um, so then the next question is, okay, how do we actually build a read-write primitive uh, using this fake dictionary structure that we have all the fake dictionary operands pointing to? Um, and it's kind of an interesting thing. So basically we, we have a repeating uh, hex 40-byte blob that represents this dic dictionary structure. Um, so there's a 16-byte dictionary header that specifies one entry, and this is kind of part of that opaque dictionary structure I, I said I would explain later. I don't know what actually what a lot of these are, but basically if you want to create a dictionary with a single entry, you can just sort of roughly lay it out like this. Um, and so we put this into this for, yeah, hex 40 byte blob that we're spraying. Um, and then the next uh, hex 14 bytes are basically um, the key value pair associated with a single entry. So there's an unknown value, and then we've got some key which points to um, a, you know some name that we can look up. And then we also include a separate array, um, and we have both of those operands point into the hex 40 byte blob that we're constructing. So basically at offset 18, you can see that the pointer points at offset 24 and at offset 20, the uh, pointer points at offset 28. Um, so this basically lets us have these operands that are all referencing the same blob of memory. So the, for the name, we can just create like a key for it. So we can have it reference some uh, value that we can look up in order to then access the array later. And then, uh, the array, we have two entries, which I mentioned. So in that case, it's two operands, so it's 16 bytes. Um, and basically, we can use these two array uh, elements as a read-write primitive. And the way we do that is basically we create the first entry in the array. Uh, we make it a string that points to the second entry. So we can constantly use the first entry to update the second entry with whatever pointer we want, whenever we need to, or, or length as well, or type. Um, whenever we want to change it. So yeah, we can see the address at um, um, 2C, offset 2C, is um, the, the value of uh, array element zero, and it points to the next one, and then we can just modify it at will. Um, yeah, so pretty straightforward. So. Um, Altogether, it looks kind of complicated, but it, you know, uh, it's kind of broken into fairly straightforward little chunks. And so basically, yeah, what we do is we have this hex 40 byte blob and we just repeat it. We just use the hex literal string to repeat that and just spray it into memory and eventually we can have that at some predictable address. And so then all of those um, dictionary operands will point there. So this is basically just looking at the fake dictionary at, at the guest sprayed address in memory, and we can see that there is in fact the EDG zero key, and then uh, some array, and we can dump the array, and we see that at index zero, the value points to B00, B0, which is actually the address of array at index one, and so the, that's basically our primitive array. And so yeah, if we go, back to what I just showed where eventually we uh, got the font dependency vector back to us from the um, the call to compose font and we dumped it out of the, the font object that was returned. Uh, we can see again at the, the top the, the dictionary values that we had placed with the fake operands and again we can just dump them and confirm that they do in fact point to the dictionary structure that we control. Um, Yep, that we sprayed. So, um, yeah, it's pretty much um, the same as like what I just showed, but I'm going to show it a little bit again with diagrams just in case it wasn't clear, but I'll just walk through what it looks like to actually read the address of the mem copy got entry. So, um, if we assume on the left, uh, in white on the bottom, we've got some copy of our read-write array primitive. 
we can basically grab a copy of uh, index zero uh, onto the stack, which is the blue one on the left. And we can see that it points into the read-write primitive array on the right. And then basically we can use something like put interval to update it. Um, and so we have the pointer then point to mem copy in the global offset table. Um, and then afterwards, basically, we grab a copy of the uh, array element at index one, and then we can use put interval, um, or in this case, we're using get interval to then read the address of mem copy from the global offset table. But yeah. Um, yeah, so that's basically it. Uh, once you've got that, like, I think the main takeaway of this, even though this bug is a lot more complicated than the index bug, that I think with exploiting these in general is as soon as you can get control of operands on the operand stack, you're, it's pretty much game over, especially if it's repeatable. If you've just got one that you can't change, you have to be a little bit careful. But if you can do something like um, create the primitive with the two array elements, then you, you have something you can repeat from within PostScript itself. So... Um, yeah, that went a bit faster than I was expecting. But um, in conclusion, I think it's pretty interesting. Like, um, it's a, a pretty huge attack service, if you can imagine. It's 900 pages, and there's, like, hundreds of operators and stuff. And it's kind of cool to see a totally custom stack, because usually when you see PostScript stuff, it's, like, Adobe and, and GoScript. And I, there's been a bunch of Apple stuff, too. Um, but yeah, I mentioned that there was another person, Chris Anastasio. He exploited two different PostScript bugs at Pondone as well and hasn't published anything. So it would be cool if he actually shares some of his research as well. Um, and I guess another interesting thing is like, um, a lot of this is kind of predicated on there not being um, position independent um, executable for PageMaker. But really, it's probably not entirely required anyways. Like if you imagine the operands that we can build, as long as you can control some operand on the operand stack, it's probably enough because you could, um, because you can still spray the heap addresses, you, you could guess where the heap is and then use the operands to basically leak the heap. And I, I'm, I assume it would be quite easy to find pointers back into PageMaker or other libraries on the, the heap. Um, that way. So even if they add pi, I think they're going to struggle just um, because of the, the complexity of the whole thing. Um, and yeah, because of other printers we looked at that were, they had no concept of security at all. I, I thought it was kind of surprising and cool that they had the sandbox, but there's a lot of sort of low hanging uh, privilege escalation bugs like the one Blasty explodes or um, published and exploited. So they have to obviously fix that stuff first. Uh, before it's effective. Uh, yeah, and so this is like just totally unrelated, but I mentioned this last year when I spoke as well, but I do all of my research with my voice, uh, and I don't usually use a keyboard or a mouse at all, um, and I, I'm still able to do my work, and so I just wanted to give a shout out to some of the tools that allow me to actually do that, because um, it's a lot harder than using the keyboard and mouse, but it's cool that uh, I can still do research. Um, but yeah, it's just a reminder to people, uh, especially if you're new and you don't realize sitting in front of a computer for 25 years takes quite the toll on the body. So you should take care of yourself. Remember to sit up straight and stretch and stuff. So yeah, that's all.